Welcome, beautiful people. We invite you in this moment to prepare your hearts and your minds and your souls to experience the presence of the very living God. unite together in this ancient confession of Christian faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Hey y'all, how y'all doing? Well today, um, I'm out here, I'm outside and it's pretty. It's cooler uh, because the seasons are about to change. It happens every year, all the time, seasons are changing. Uh, so we go from summer, just like that. It was summer just a little bit ago, and now just a matter of short amount of time, all the leaves will be changing and everybody uh, will be wearing warmer clothes and it'll be fall y'all um, your moms will probably be wearing boots with sweaters and scarves and saying words like pumpkin spice, pumpkin spice uh, that signifies change from summer to fall um uh but that's the way god made it god made us to change and to uh for things not to be stagnant and the same all the time that's the way God wants it to be, so we grow and become who we need to become. Uh, if we stay the same all the time, um, we'll figure something out. Say we'll figure out second grade. We'll be like, I'm good at second grade. But then, oh no, you gotta move up to third grade. And so third grade is a little bit, I'm a little stressed. You know what I mean? Third grade is different, you know? Um, so we're changing all the time. Our bodies change, the seasons change. Uh, everything's changing. So, um, like just uh i had like i got reading glasses now i gotta keep reading glasses close by because i can't read nothing anymore up close um and it just happened just like that all of a sudden one day uh but that's good you know what i mean that's good um they make me look more distinguished uh i'll do things like this um but um so, uh, so when we're scared of change, know that that's what God wants. Um, and that's what God said is going to happen, is change. And again, it's just an opportunity just for us to grow, to be who God wants us to be. Because in order to grow, things have to change. We have to change, and things around us change, which makes us change. So change is good. It causes stress, but it's a good stress because we're growing to be who we need to be, better people and more like Jesus, okay? So uh, we'll pray right quick. Uh, dear God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for change. Sometimes we're scared of it, but help us to know that it causes us to grow into the people that you want us to be. We thank you for change. Uh, we thank you for everything. Uh, we love you, amen. Holy God, thank you for being in our midst. Thank you for filling this place with your Holy Spirit. We ask that you continue to fill this place and the homes and places of all of our video watchers with your peace and your presence. 
God, you alone are worthy of our praise, and to you alone we bow and offer our heartfelt gratitude and worship. We thank you so much for the ways that we see your hand at work in our lives and in our world. We thank you that you go before us and you prepare our ways. Nothing is secret from you. And you know us and love us without measure and without end. We also thank you for the gift of Jesus who brings to us a new way of living, the opportunity of living life eternally in your presence and gives to us forgiveness. We ask that you forgive us of our many sins. Please give us a fresh start as we purpose to move forward as greater and stronger disciples of Jesus so that we can better share your love with a world that desperately needs it. We live in a wonderful nation. We live in a nation that is free. We thank you for that and we thank you for all of those who have made our freedoms possible. Please guide our leaders in the ways of justice and peace. Put wise advisors around them and God enable them and equip them to do the jobs to which they have been elected. Please be with our military, our law enforcement and our first responders. Put a hedge of protection around them and let them sense your presence. We ask that those leaders be guided in wisdom also. What a blessing it is to worship at and serve God with Pleasant Hill United Methodist Church. Thank you for our rich history of ministry and service. By your Holy Spirit, continue to inspire us in the ways that we can reach out into our community and world. Help us to be a beacon of love and a refuge of peace and hope within our community. Lord, we know that you know each need that we lift before you. We know that you're already at work in each need and that you will bring your answers in your time and in your way. Help us to remain faithful as we continue to hold fast to the promises found in your word. We ask God that you touch powerfully all of those who are sick and infirm. Let your presence flow through them. Let them fill you with them bring comfort to them, and bring ease to their distress. Please guide their medical teams in wisdom and refresh and strengthen their caregivers. We ask God that you hold close all of those who mourn. Shelter them under your wing and give to them a peace that comes only from you. Lord, if we're honest, we realize that we're reeling right now and we don't really know what to expect. We know that you see ahead. We know that you are God no matter what we see and hear. Help us to trust you fully. Help us to realize that you are always with us. Speak to us words of comfort and words of encouragement in ways that we understand. We thank you, God, for all that you do for us. We thank you for your son, Jesus, who has taught us all to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today, we're going to continue in the ninth chapter of Mark, beginning in the 38th verse. Teacher, said John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said. For no one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. Truly, I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to the Messiah will certainly not lose their reward. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where the worms that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good. But if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with each other. 
Shall we pray? Oh, Father God, in the next few moments, we pray that you would take these confusing, disturbing, strange words and that you would give us gospel, good news, that might change our lives for the better. For it's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Yeah, you know, I think it's safe to say that the disciples are not very happy. In fact, they're angry. Uh, they're really angry. You see, they've come across this man. This man who is casting out demons in the name of Jesus. That sounds good, right? The problem is the disciples don't even know this man. Hmm. They've never met this man. And that makes them angry. Well, that doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? I mean, if this man's out here making the world a better place in Jesus' name, you would think that the disciples would be, well, happy to see this man doing such great things. Why are they so angry? Well, truth be told, they're angry because they're jealous. You see, just a a couple of days earlier, a couple of days earlier, this father had brought his son, who just happened to be demon-possessed. He brought his son to the disciples, and he asked them, he begged them to help his son to cast this demon out of his son. And no matter how hard those disciples tried. <laughs> they couldn't help that man. They couldn't cast that demon out of that man's son. No matter what they said, no matter what they did, no matter how hard they tried. Now do you get it? They're mad. They're angry. Because this stranger, this man that they've never met. This man who is not one of those 12 disciples is doing what they're not able to do. He's doing in the name of Jesus what they're not able to do. So they demand. They demand that this man cease and desist from doing what he's doing. <laughs> Making the world a better place. Because that makes sense. Right? So they sort of confess to Jesus. They confess to Jesus what it is they've witnessed and what it is they've done. And they informed Jesus that they had commanded that this man stop. And how does Jesus respond? Pretty much responds, What were you thinking? Jesus says, don't tell him to stop. No one who performs a miracle in my name can turn around in the next moment and say anything bad about me. Don't you get it? Whoever is not against us is for us. And I tell you, anyone who simply offers a cup of water in my name 
will surely, surely be rewarded. Now you got to remember, the disciples have just been sort of dressed down by Jesus. Jesus has just confronted them about their constant arguing about who among them is the greatest. And you remember Jesus said, well, the greatest needs to be least. The first will be last. Let the first among you be the servant of all. You see, this man may have been late to the party. This man may have been after the disciples had encountered Jesus. He has his encounter with Jesus. But this man is still a disciple. This man is still a follower of Jesus Christ. Whether he's casting out demons or simply offering a cup of water. You know, Jesus is sort of asking them, why? Why does this even matter to you? Why do you even care about what someone else is doing in my name? And Jesus sort of points out something that they ought to care about. Something that they ought to be mindful of. Something that ought to matter. In verse 42. Jesus says, if anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea Ouch! You see, the disciples, the disciples were accusing this man, if you will, of, of being a stumbling block. Accusing this man of doing harm. And Jesus is pretty much pointing out, no, no. You're the ones who are the stumbling blocks. You're the ones who are causing harm. And Jesus goes on to talk about what's going to happen and the consequences of being a stumbling block to yourself and others. Double ouch. And then come these strange seemingly horrific words. Jesus says, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to stumble, Cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where the worms that eat them do not die and the fire is never quenched. Now again, he's telling his disciples that you are your own stumbling blocks. Not this man casting out demons. He's pretty much telling them that as you find yourself stumbling around, you're causing others to stumble. So come to grips with what it is that causes you to stumble and do something about it. 
you know, Jesus kind of sounds like my dad when we were kids and we were getting out of hand and here'd come that phrase, cut it out. Now, for those of you who insist on taking every word in Scripture literally, don't go cutting any body parts off just yet. You see, Jesus is using hyperbole. In this case, he's simply saying that we need to rid ourselves of those things in our life that serve as stumbling blocks, that lead us into sin, that cause us to do harm, not only to ourselves but to others, to do something about those things in our life that serve as stumbling blocks in our relationship with God and with each other. So Jesus says, if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. Problem solved. That's easy enough, right? I mean, I could survive with just one hand. I can survive with just one foot. I can survive with just one eye. I can survive without any hands. I can survive without any feet. I can survive without any eyes. I can survive without any of these things. But it won't do any good. You know why? It's not my hands that cause me to stumble. Even though with these hands, I've committed some pretty unrighteous acts. I've built up things that shouldn't be built up and I've torn down things that shouldn't be torn down. And it's not my feet that really cause me to stumble. It's not my feet that do harm even though with these feet I've often walked the wrong path and with these feet I've taken some pretty ungodly stands. And it's not these eyes. It's not these eyes that cause me to stumble. It's not these eyes that cause me to sin. It's not these eyes that cause harm, even though I'm guilty of letting them be fixated on all the wrong images and all the wrong idols and all the wrong gods. But it's not my hands. It's not my feet. It's not my eyes that are the problem. It's my heart. You know, the source of all my desires? It's my heart that causes me to stumble. It's my heart that leads me into sin. It's my heart, or lack thereof, that causes me to do such great harm. And while I can survive without hands, and while I can survive without feet, and while I can survive without eyes, I cannot live without a heart. So what am I supposed to do about that? It's sort of what Jesus is talking about when he asked the question, if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? What do I do about my heart? The psalmist David once asked the same question, and in the 51st Psalm, David prays this prayer to God. He prays, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. 
Create in me a clean heart. Create in me a new heart. You see, I need a new heart. I need the very heart of Jesus. And I need God to do it for me. You see, I can't do that myself. You know, I think I get it now. I think I get why it was those disciples that day, well, they couldn't cast out that demon. No matter how hard they tried. And I think I get it now why this man, this stranger, is able to do what they can't do. You see, it says he was casting out demons in the name of Jesus. Now, there's another way of phrasing that. There's an even more powerful way of saying he was doing what he was doing with the heart of Jesus. You see, we see in the ninth chapter of Mark that the disciples' hearts are filled with so many things, all the wrong things, anything but Jesus. Their hearts are filled with ambition. Their hearts are filled with fear. Their hearts are filled with doubt. Their hearts are preventing them from doing things in the name of Jesus. Their hearts are what's causing them to stumble and in turn causing other little ones to stumble as well. They needed new hearts. That's what Jesus is trying to say. They need the very heart of Jesus. Let me ask you a question this morning. What's in your heart? King Solomon, in the fourth proverb, King Solomon says, Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flows the springs of life. And I might add, or flows the springs of death. Are we like the disciples? Do we need a new heart? May it be the very heart of Jesus. What do you think, you and I? What do you think we could really accomplish for the kingdom of God if we truly did everything that we do, said everything that we say with the very heart of Jesus. I believe, I believe we would be amazed at the difference it would make in this world because I believe that we might begin to see one another transformed into the very likeness of Jesus Christ with the very heart of Jesus. And we might see this world transformed into something that so resembles the kingdom of God. We might see the coming of a new heaven and a new earth if we just had the hearts of Jesus. So I conclude with this prayer. Create in me a clean heart, O Lord, and renew a right spirit within me. 
create in me a heart like yours, Jesus, and renew in me the very image of God. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.